Hello, my fellow Gadotians. Today we're going to be covering primitives and pointers. And we covered previously the integrals, and we're now we're moving on to the rest of the primitives, right? Um, so primitives are basic built-in data types um, that just come with a system, right? So we have char, which remember was the smallest of the integers. Um, chars are usually used to represent visual characters. So you have a specific number like hex value 68 that would correspond to some symbol that you would visually see on screen, such as H. Okay. Um, how do you actually know how they match up? That would be based on the character encoding. Um, so that would be like ASCII, UTF-8, UTF-16, some other things you might have heard of. Um, the syntax to express a character value is to have single quotes and then whatever symbol is used for the character value. Um, so here I have H, I've got the character value 0, which would correspond to the number 30 in ASCII, uh, has, uh, hex 30. Um, and then it, you can also have special symbols where you do a backslash to escape, and then you have some sequence of characters that correspond to a special symbol. Um, that could be like for new line, carriage return, or in this case, um, we have null, uh, the null terminator. So it's actually the value of zero just expressed as a character. Um, you can change how your compiler takes the literals and encodes them into numbers. Um, and that's based on the character encoding that you supply to your compiler. Um, so that's just for your future in reference. Uh, then we get into C strings. So C strings are where you have a sequence of characters that end with a null terminator that we just mentioned. So in this case, I have a double quoted string, right? That is hello, okay? And if I break it down, that actually creates in the computer a sequence of characters, which are H, E, L, L, O, that are all separately encoded with their own numbers. And then I end that sequence with a null terminator. Um, if you looked at this in memory, if you tried to print hello, it's gonna go letter by letter and print everything until it gets to a null terminator. So whenever we get to the point where we're building strings manually, if you built a string, a C string, that did not have a null terminator, it would get to the end of the hello and then just keep on going printing arbitrary trash until you suddenly encountered a zero by chance. So make sure you have a null terminator at the end of your, your strings. Uh, some terminology to know is that strings have a size, which is the number of characters that are actually part of the string. So in this case, hello would have a size of five. And then you have the capacity, which is the amount of memory that has been allocated for the string. So in this case, we don't necessarily know how much memory it is, we just because we just have a value of hello. Um, but we do know it requires at least six bytes, because you need five bytes at least for each of the uh, characters, and then one byte for the null terminator. And that's assuming that the size of a char is one byte, which in most machines it is. But uh, so. Do note that C strings are not objects that have their own advanced functionality. They are primitives. You just have some sequence of numbers that exist somewhere. So they don't have the ability to know their own size or the ability to um, tell you, like, oh, I can print myself or like something. There's, there's no functionality associated with them. They're just data. Um, GDScript, Python, C Sharp, and other high-level languages will just automatically rep, uh, wrap any uh, literal string you put, the double quotes or whatever, or, or in Python, they even allow single quotes and stuff and GDScript, um, but they'll just take those strings and they'll automatically wrap them in a string object that has advanced features. That's not how it works in C++. Um, you can also represent numbers visually with character encodings. So here I have the number 1000, I'm representing it as a string. I'm also assigning 1000 to a two byte short and if you compare the byte sizes for these, you can see how text format is just, by its very nature, bigger than binary format. Like, that's just how they're storing the data. Um, so, and that's like before you even get into compression algorithms that can make binary stuff even smaller. So um, that's why people for size go with binary. Um, so float and double are where you have very large, very small or partial values that are represented in a certain number of bits, okay? Um, they essentially use scientific notation where if you wanted to represent negative 
you'd have one bit allocated to the sign. So if the bit is set, if it's one, um, then it's negative. And then you'd have some bits reserved for the significant, which are the actual digits that exist in the number, the non-zero digit. Like if you trimmed all the zeros off the beginning and end, and you just have the central digits, those are your significant. And then you have the exponent, which is like, in this case, it would be like 10 to the negative 2, right? That negative 2 would be your exponent. And because floating point values are actually stored in binary, they use base 2 for the exponent, not base 10. Um, but the concept is still kind of the same. Um, so here with float and double, you can see the distribution of bits for each of them. You can see the significant is way bigger in a double. Um, so you can have a huge amount of detail. You can have very large numbers, right? And you have an even bigger exponent value. But if we compare the range differences to integers, it's just crazy how big of a difference this is. So int 32 and int 64 have uh, positive and negative 4 and 9 respe respectively for the number of like tens they can accommodate, right? So you have like 32,000, you've got 2 billion. Okay, with float, you have a negative positive 38, so like massive number, and then here 308, just ridiculously huge range of numbers. Um, so that's why they use scientific notation to, and they basically, rather than storing the actual number, they can focus on storing the amount that the number has moved or the amount of detail there exists in the number and not so much hey how many zeros are there okay zero 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 you know it doesn't do that um, there are some special flags for the exponent value so if you have all zeros in the exponent it represents positive or negative zero and then if you have all f's all ones um, then it represents positive or negative infinity or perhaps not a number okay so you have the ability to represent something that you couldn't represent with an integer value. Um, the cost of all of this magic is you lose the bit precision. So with an integer, you can directly compare them no problem. I have a 1, I add a 2 to it, I get a 3, I compare that to a 3, and it works. With a float or a double, I have 1, I add 2 to it, but then I get something that might be close to three, but not necessarily guaranteed to be three. And that's just because of truncation, overflow, and underflow that occurs when you have these obscenely long numbers that are being combined with one another. It just naturally happens in the CPU. And so you never want to compare float values with one another directly because there's no guarantee that the comparison will be right. Uh, you always compare the two values using some kind of threshold that is called the epsilon. Um, so in this example here, I take the absolute value, which removes the sign uh, bit of it, uh, just takes out what the sign is, and then I'm finding the difference between the two values, and then I see if that difference is less than some small number to see if they're close enough to each other to be relevant, to be considered equivalent. Um, so next one is references. Okay, References are basically a compile time search and replace mechanism for the compiler. Um, so you take an ampersand and you attach it to the data type declaration of a variable. Okay, It's part of the data type. So here I have a two literal with no address. I take my two literal and I assign it to an int a. So it copies the value from the literal into the memory address at a. Okay. I then take A and I copy it or assign it to B, which takes the looks up the memory address of where A is, grabs the value of it, and then copies that value to B. Okay. Now I make int ampersand C equal to A. I'm not performing any operation here. I'm just telling the compiler, hey, anytime you see the symbol C, I want you to think of it as me referencing symbol A. So then we say int d equal to c, and what it does is say, oh, c, I'm supposed to get that as a. And so then it looks up the address of a and gets the value there, 2, and then it copies 2 over to d. Okay, So you really are just automatically replacing the memory addresses that are being referenced by these variable symbols in the symbol lookup table. Okay, 
Now the value must exist ahead of time, right? There has to be something in the symbol table that has an address. It must be a concrete addressable value that has a presence there. Um, so if you try to assign it to a literal, it's going to be like, there's no address for this. It's not a known thing with a name. So no, I'm not going to, I'm going to give you an error. Um, and if you don't initialize a reference, it's like, I have no idea what I'm supposed to swap this reference with. You got to give me something. So references also cannot be mutated once they're declared. So here I have an int ampersand C equal to A. And if I'm later like, oh, I want my C to start referencing the B variable instead. So I set C equal to B. I'm like, no, no, no. I'm replacing that C with A. You're assigning B to A. So now A has five instead. Okay. There's, there's no change in the references. It's kind of similar to an OS hard link where two files get linked to the same backend data in the operating system. Um, there isn't really an equivalent concept in GDScript. And there is like the notion of pass by value versus pass by reference, but they're not really the same thing. They're related, which we will get into when we talk about functions and stuff. Um, but they're not really the same. So don't, even though they both say reference, don't confuse the two. So now pointers, the fun stuff. Okay. So pointers are integral values that store memory addresses that point to a particular type. Okay. Um, they're technically an integer, an unsigned integer value associated with your architecture. So if you have a 32 bit machine, they're UN32. If they're a 64 bit machine, 64 bit, right? Um, the syntax is to have an asterisk associated with the data type, just like a reference would. Okay, so you have a symbol associated with a data type. And then you would assign it to ampersand x, which in this case, ampersand is not a reference. It's actually, because the ampersand isn't part of the declaration of a variable, it's an ampersand being applied to an expression. So it's actually a completely different operator. And in this case, it's an operator that says, hey, whatever expression is to the right of me, I want to get the address of whatever value is in that expression if one exists, okay? And in this case, you're saying, oh, well, there's an X value of two. And when I look up the, the address of that two, it corresponds to the X variable, which is this memory address. And now I'm, I've essentially converted my int into an int pointer because I'm getting the memory address of the int. So now I'm directly assigning the int pointer value in the expression to my int pointer Y. And that's how the cast is happening. So I have the correct data type when I'm assigning the value. So things to note here, the asterisk is what marks it as a pointer. You don't have a complete type until you pair the asterisk with a data type. So you have an int pointer, okay? And then as we mentioned, the ampersand is part of the expression. So it's the address of operator rather than a declaration, which is what you would see if you had some kind of type ampersand. Um, you also cannot cast between primitive pointer types. So if I have a, an integer x and I use the address of operator on it, which essentially gives me an int pointer because it gives me the memory address, I can't assign that int pointer value from the expression to a float pointer. It'll be like, no, you can't cast these, just like I can't assign you know, other different data types. Um, it, it, same thing happens if you explicitly create an int pointer and then directly assign the it pointer to the float pointer. You're going to get the same exact error. I don't know how to cast from int pointer to float pointer. Um, there are ways to like manually copy memory from one place to another without having any regard to type information, but it results in undefined behavior. So don't ever do it. And I have a link so you know the details of it and we're not going to cover it, but there it is. Um, you can also arbitrarily nest pointers. So I can have an int pointer y, which points to the address of x, and I have int pointer pointer z, which points to the address of y. Okay. Uh, you'll learn more about why people might want to do this when we cover arrays and 2D arrays and like matrices. You can just create arbitrary dimensions of like stuff. Um, that's that's where that stuff comes into play. Um, which we will not cover anytime soon. Well, maybe eventually. Um, so then the placement of the asterisk is kind of driven by convention. You can associate it with the data type or the symbol. It doesn't necessarily matter. It's just kind of your, your coding convention. Um, but there is a case where it does matter, and that's with multivariable declarations. 
Um, you can do that. So I have three I, here. I've made three different integers that are all uninitialized. So they could potentially just have arbitrary trash in their data. They're not initialized with any value. So they just have like whatever was given to them in memory. Um, but if I tried to do multivariable declarations with a pointer to an int, the pointer is only actually applied to the symbol, even if I position it to be with a data type. So this line, the first line, actually makes one int pointer and one int. It doesn't make two integer pointers. You have to reapply the asterisk on the symbol to ensure that both data types are an integer pointer. And even if you move it off to the side of the data type, it just kind of looks odd. Uh, but it, so don't do that. <laughs> But also, um, generally speaking, multivariable declarations just don't happen that often. Like, it doesn't look very good. You usually want to, like, I have a line where I declare, declare a variable and assign it an initial value. And I do that line by line. That's just good, readable code. Um, so you don't see it very often. Uh, you don't see multivariable declarations that often. So then it goes back to just being a coding convention, which whatever code base you're working in is going to have its own decision about how it chooses to do that. Um, for future reference, Godot uses this style. So now, how do pointers compare to references? Okay, So unlike a reference, a pointer is a variable with its own distinct value and memory. Right? I can, I can create an integer z, and because it's or I can create an int pointer zero z, and because it's not actually like a pure reference to another thing, it has a value. I can declare it with no initialization. I can initialize it later with a first value, and I can even mutate the value to change what the z is pointing to later on. That's not something you can do with references. Um, another thing is that in order to access the value of a reference, you can just use it directly, right? So beforehand, or as, as you can see here, I have an int x equals zero, uh, t, 2, um, and I have an int ampersand y set to the x. So now I can just directly use y to refer to the x when I'm assigning its value to z here. Okay? But if I make an int pointer a equal to the address of x, so I have the value of the x, I can't just directly assign the a to, a, to an integer b because I would be taking the memory address inside of a and I'd be passing it into b. So I have to use something called the dereference operator. So you use an asterisk on an expression, just like we did with the ampersand, except it kind of inverts the process. So whereas ampersand would extract the address from a value, the asterisk is going to say, no, 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 I want you to take the memory address in the expression and dereference it. So I'm going to go to the place in memory that this is pointing to, and I'm going to grab the value from it. How does it know how many bytes to grab based on the data type of the pointer? Okay, so you have an A that is an integer pointer, and you want to dereference the integer pointer, so it needs to grab grab size of int bytes at that location and bring them back, and then attempt to store them or copy them into the int B. Okay, so the, that's why you have to pair the data type with the pointer. Um, the pointers are also, because they're integral values, you can perform arithmetic with them. Okay, So here I have an, a char pointer s equal to the double quoted string hello. Okay, This is how you actually have the data type of a C string, is it's a pointer to some character. Okay, In this case, it's pointing to the first character. Right? So I have a memory address here, the, the s symbol will be pointing to the first character in this sequence of string of sorry it'll be pointing to the first uh it, the first slot of this sequence of characters okay in order to get each of the individual characters i can take the s which is the starting point i can figure out the size of the char okay which in most cases would be 1 i multiply that by which index in that sequence I want to get. And so in this case, it would be zero for the first slot. And then I'm wrapping all that in parentheses and dereferencing it. So I'm going to that point in memory, grabbing the char and bringing it back. So that gets me the H. 
if I repeat this operation for each of the indexes or indices, right, I take one, I multiply it by the index I want, or take the size of the char, multiply it by the index, so now I'm at index one. I'm adding that that number of bytes, however big the size of the data type is to the sequence, okay, I'm adding that to the beginning memory position, so I'm moving along the sequence the correct number of bytes. And then I'm grabbing, because I'm dereferencing, I'm grabbing all the bytes I need for the char, which in this case is usually one. I'm grabbing those bytes, I'm bringing it back, and I'm putting it in the char E. And I'm repeating it again and again and again for each of the indexes to grab all the different characters. Okay? This is in practice what we will see with arrays. Right? This is how arrays kind of work. Uh, and this is why your pointers are always referring to the starting position of an array, um, or they're pointing to a single value. Uh, you don't necessarily know, just based on the data type, which of the two it is. So you kind of have to know by the context. Um, pointers do have a keyword expression for the zero address, which is the keyword null pointer. Um, this is where the null concept in GDScript comes from. Um, you can just directly assign a zero to an integer, but what actually happens is the integer pointer on a 64-bit machine would be a 64-bit value. The literal zero is a signed int that's 32 bits. So what you're actually doing is implicitly casting the signed int to an int pointer, and then because there are more bits on the left, it's zero filling the remaining bits and then storing the information in your int pointer variable. Um, now, because pointers themselves are mutable and they can be changed to different things, they're also always potentially unsafe. You can access incorrect memory and get runtime exceptions. References, in contrast, are always safe. So the kinds of things that can go wrong are your pointer could be set to null. So if you dereference it, you're accessing nothing. It could be set to some arbitrary location in the computer because you can just assign whatever number you want. Okay, So it's not necessarily going to be the right data type, or you might not even have uh, asked permission to have access to that memory. Um, and then you could also have a situation, which we'll learn about in the next lesson, where you have an integer pointer and you have some temporary context we'll get into where you've created a legit variable and you've set the pointer to point to that variable, but then when that temporary context goes away and you no longer have that memory, you're not actually pointing to valid memory anymore. So when you dereference the pointer to get that thing, it's like, no, 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 that, that's no longer a real variable. I'm not going to let you touch that memory. And so you get a runtime exception. And all of these things will result in runtime exceptions that crash the entire program. So you always have to check for these things constantly. Like every time you get a new pointer in some new context, you must verify that the pointer is good before, like is actually correct, non-null, before you deal with it. And you also just kind of have to trust that it's pointing to the correct data type, um, which should usually be handled by the data type of the pointer, but they also have other kinds of pointers that don't necessarily do that. So it can get really iffy in the world of C and C++, just so you know. Um, so finally, we get to pointer operators. Okay, um, There's a different usage of pointers with classes. Okay, So I, here I have some class that has a field of x. And because it's a struct, it's a publicly accessible variable, right? default to public access modifier. I then create a local instance of the sum class called sc. I can easily extract the value of one of, of the x field and store it in a y variable using the dot operator. Okay. Then if I make a pointer for a sum class instance and I assign it to the address of the sc, I can't I can no longer just directly access it through the pointer with dot. If I try to do this, it's because the, the int pointer type doesn't know what to do with dot. It's not aware of how to work with that. Um, so what the compiler does let you use is an arrow syntax. So if you switch it to an arrow with, with a dash and a greater than sign, then it allows you to go to the point in memory and grab the value. 
But then you run into another problem because when you are using the pointer, you still have to dereference the value, right? You have to use a dereference operator in some way you would think, except that's not really what it what works when the asterisk is used. Uh, you can't apply the asterisk to your pointer arrow x, um, partly because the operator stuff doesn't work the same way. Like the order of operations is different because asterisk and ampersand on an expression um, have a lower priority. So it it's just like, no, 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 you can't use an asterisk on this. You're already using the arrow to go to the place. So the two ways that do work are you use an ampersand or an asterisk, but you wrap the pointer in it so that you dereference it first and then you have an actual object instance where you can do dot x. The other way is to just use the arrow, which handles the dereferencing for you and, and also gets the field, okay? Um, now, how does the compiler know that the stored address is legit? You know, it could be a null pointer. It's not necessarily safe, right? So what if you wanna use a reference, okay? If you use some class ampersand and you reference the pointer, you're going to get a problem because the pointer isn't the same data type as what the ampersand is being applied to, right? You have a some class reference. You don't have a some class pointer reference. So the pointer um, parameter can't be assigned, or the pointer variable can't be assigned to your SC ref. Um, if you dereference the pointer first to get the actual object instance, then your SC ref is going to say, oh, okay, this is the object, and now I know that I'm referencing this object. Or you could actually create like a some class pointer reference and assign that to pointer. So now you have a search, comp a compile time search and replace for the pointer variable. Okay, that's a very, very different thing. Um, so as I've said before, you got to be careful with dereferencing null pointer because you'll get runtime exceptions all over the place. These segmentation faults are where you're attempting to access memory that has not been allocated to your program yet or correctly or something. So you have some segment of memory that you're not supposed to be getting into. And that's where you get these, these runtime exceptions. Um, in contrast, the SC ref, the, the reference type, will be 100% safe all the time. So whenever you can, use a reference instead of a pointer where applicable. So the last thing I want to cover is Booleans, partly because they kind of require you to know all the other data types, to know the role they play in C++ versus a dynamic language. So in GDScript and many other dynamic languages, many non-zero things will just implicitly cast to false. Um, and this is, this is like you can have an empty data structure, you can have a zero filled numeric structure of some kind, um, you can have an empty string. And each of these things, regardless of its you know, array, dictionary, some kind of pool, star, array type, um, any of the vectors and color, of course, these things um, color with a zero, because if you uh, don't give a parameter, it actually defaults to one for the alpha, alpha value, um, so which would make it true. Uh, but if you have all zeros for those things, or if it's a, a container of some sort, if the container is empty, then those data structures will implicitly cast to false. And this, in, in the programming field, is referred to a falsy value, because it's kind of false, but not really. It's just conceptually empty in practice. And so the dynamic languages try to make it more user-friendly by saying, oh yeah, oh yeah, this is totally false. Um, so JavaScript, PHP, GDScript, uh, Python, like a lot of different things will do this. So here's an example where my variable, which is an array, um, I cast it to a bool, to a bool, boolean uh, by just it, applying it to a not. So the not is looking for a boolean operation. It implicitly casts the R variable to a bool, which makes it false. You not it, which inverts it. So then the if statement sees a true, which then enters the code block and executes the R is empty logic. Um, the type information is, however, retained. So for example, here I have an array and a dictionary. And if I say, well, the array is empty, and if the array is equal to the dictionary, then they're both empty. That doesn't work, because the array being compared to the dictionary doesn't know how to do that. They're not the same object. 
But if you do the same thing, but you first explicitly cast the array and the dictionary to their Boolean equivalents, then if they're both empty, and or if they're both the same emptiness state, and if the array is empty, then you can infer that the dictionary is also empty. So that's where you could then print that the that both of them are empty. In C++, false is actually zero the number, like all zero bits. So true would be any non-zero value, including negatives. And as I said before, in C++, everything is a number. From the day one, we talked about that. So each data type, therefore, has its own representation of the zero value. You've got false, you've got zero, you've got the null terminator for chars, um, double is 0.0, .0 and float is actually 0.0f. You have an f suffix to mark it as a float literal. Um, I never mentioned that. And then for pointers, you have the null pointer keyword. Prior to C++11, there was no null pointer keyword. They actually had a C++ macro, which is something that just goes through and automatically replaces text. We'll get into that later. Um, and so they had a macro for all caps null, which would get replaced with a zero. So you'd actually be using a zero literal for the memory addresses. Um, but that, you know, nowadays we have null pointer. Um, and then you have the reference, which, you know, it doesn't actually have a value in a runtime application. Like there's no data or value associated with them. So there's no expression of false for a reference. Um, now you get into like C++ classes, which by default have no integration with primitives. So they don't know how to work with a primitive unless you teach them how to work with a primitive. And that is also true for Booleans. So if you just take create a whole bunch of instances of these different data types and you OR them all together with Boolean OR operators, which is what that looks like in C++, um, then you're going to be trying to implicitly cast all of them to bool, and you'll get tons of errors because none of them know how to do it. They're like, well, what the heck is this bool thing you're telling me to become? Um, they do usually have methods that can be used in place of that, right? So the containers will have a size function a lot of times. Maybe it's length, maybe it's count. Different, you know, different languages and APIs will have different methods, but it all amounts to give me the number of elements in the collection. Um, and so you can use that integer in place of the object for doing that same kind of thing. Um, for thing for structures that have some fields um, for quick, you know, uh, organization of data, like a vector two or something like that, a lot of times there will be logic that teaches the class how to compare against itself for equality. Um, so then you can use that by creating an, a zero filled version of the same class and compare it. Um, with that data to see if they're equivalent. And if so, you know that the variable you're looking at is also empty. Okay? And that's how you would do the same logic of oring everything together by, you know, based on what kind of tools you have available to manipulate the data type to create the same conceptual logic that a dynamic programming language would be doing for you. Um, zero strictness in C++ also leads to some kind of unexpected behavior in dynamic, or from dynamic languages to the static language. So um, I have an int x equal to zero. I have an int pointer that is pointing to that x. If I take the point, if I take the pointer and I dereference it, I get to the zero, so I find a false value. But if I just look at the pointer. It's a non-zero memory address, so I actually get a true value, even though the value of the that the that the pointer is pointing to is zero. So there's a very clear difference there. Um, similar thing kind of happens with a an empty string, where the empty string is a sequence of characters, but the size is zero, which means that there are no bytes preceding the null terminator that the pointer is pointing to. So the, the pointer is pointing to the first place in memory for the C string, but there are no characters, so it's just the null terminator terminating the string. Null terminator is the number zero. So when we dereference the pointer to extract the character value there, we get zero, so it's false. But the null terminator exists somewhere in memory that is non-zero. So the pointer itself is actually non-zero, so it's true. Um, you have a similar kind of, uh, you have another problem when you create a class and you make a local instance of the class and then you make a pointer pointing to the class. Again, the class doesn't know how to become a bool. So if you try to cast it, the instance to a bool, 
you'll get a problem because it's like, hey, I don't know what to do with this. Um, but if you have the pointer and you cast it, that that object instance will exist somewhere in memory because you assigned it to the ampersand of some actual instance. So there's a memory address where it exists. Therefore, the memory address is non-zero. So it is true. So it gets really complicated, I know. Um, there's a lot to cover in this lesson. I'm sorry it was so long. Um, it's been a while because I've been super busy with work, um, unfortunately, but I'm happy to get this out to you guys finally. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing any of your suggestions or feedback on the series. Um, uh, if you have any things you'd like to suggest for the series, let me know, and I hope to see you guys in the future. Uh, you can see all these notes again at the Deconstructing Godot repository on my Will Nations Dev GitHub account. Be sure to check it out um, whenever you want to see the other notes that I've linked, and uh, I'll see you guys in the next video. See ya.